Commission. Here and today, we will look at the situation of human rights of intersex persons in the Americas. It's been requested ex officio by the Commission itself to gather information on the situation in respect of and violations experienced by intersex persons in the Americas. We want to welcome the four persons who will share information and make presentations today. They are Mauro Cabral, Natasha Jimenez, Jen Pagonis, and Paula Machado. Um, we welcome you. As you probably know, this is the first public hearing by the Commission in relation to intersex persons. The LGBTI unit has been in existence for a little while at the Commission. And it is a moment in which the Commission will listen carefully to you. We wish to learn, we wish to better understand and to know more, and to be able to better address the questions of human rights violations which intersex persons face. I want to introduce you and everyone to my fellow Commissioners. Um, I have with me Second Vice President Rosa Maria Ortiz, uh, who is also the Rapporteur for the Rights of Children and Adolescents. I have also Commissioner Felipe Gonzalez, former President of the Commission as well, with me. And also Fanny Gomez, um, who is well known to many of you from the LGBTI unit. Um, I want to invite you to make your presentations to us. We are keen in the Commission to learn from you and you. Jen Pagonis, I go by Pigeon as well, like the bird. Um, I agree with everything Mara just eloquently and bravely stated. Um, I have a few more things I'd like to add. Today's my birthday, and it's my 27th birthday. As this, or as this relates specifically to why I'm here, 26 years ago, a team of medical professionals discovered that I had XY chromosomes and internal testes more commonly referred to today as partial androgen sensitivity syndrome. Immediately, immediately after that, a surgery was scheduled to remove those internal testes. I was one then. <clears throat> when I was three, another surgery was performed. This time, it was to reduce the size of my clitoris, which was judged to be half a centimeter too long. Then, when I was 11 and entering puberty, I underwent another, a third surgery. This time it was to construct a more acceptable vagina via the method Morrow had described and it's called a vaginoplasty. Um, throughout this time I had a recurrent dream and I would wake up looking at the ceiling much like this but there was fluorescent tube lights and they were going past me very fast. And I looked down between my legs, and I saw rolls of what I thought was toilet paper, but now I realize it's probably gauze, soaked in blood. And I just thought it was a nightmare. Uh, nobody, nobody shared with me that these surgeries I just described were actually true and did happen to me. I was lied to and told that I had cancerous ovaries and that the doctors were saviors and saved me. Um, it wasn't until I was 18, in a university class, that I found out there was a name for my condition. And I'm so glad to be here today, because I'm really tired of telling my story this way. It's the way I'm expected to tell it. It, it all happened the way I told you, but it's only a medical timeline. What happened to me and who I am is so much more than that. And what happened is so much more than that for all the intersex youth and young adults that I work with. And that's why I'm really glad to be here today. I would like to share with you a few words from the youth and young adults who write on the blog that I coordinate as the Youth Leadership Intern for Advocates for Informed Choice. This is from Shana. Uh, she gave me permission to share this story with y'all today. She also underwent corrective surgery as an infant and has the same condition as I have. She writes, I grew up as a relative success story in the grand scheme of intersex stories. It wasn't until I was 11 that my parents broke the news that I would never be able to have children, that I would never get my period, and that I would have to take medicine in order to develop like other girls. 
My mother said something about being born without internal organs, and my parents tried to reassure me that I could, um, that I, that I could adopt. And that most significantly, I would have a, quote, completely normal sex life with my husband. It was that last part that stuck with me, she says. Over the next few years, as I clearly felt that something wasn't the way it was supposed to be, um, but I couldn't fathom that my parents would just lie to me. As the years went by, what became my struggle was not the symptoms themselves of being intersex, but rather the secrecy and the shame. This is just a snapshot of Shana's thinking, and for your information, she is currently in law school. There are countless other stories on the blog, but my time is short. In other news, I'm happy to relay some very important information that I've recently received that you guys probably know. On March 4th, the United Nations General Council gave uh, and the Special Repertoire on Torture stated that children who are born with atypical sex characteristics are often subject to irreversible sex assignment, leaving them with permanent irreversible infertility and causing severe mental suffering. While this, was, uh, while this will not immediately stop all human rights violations experienced by children with intersex conditions, it represents a huge leap for intersex rights and in our movement making this a reality. And lastly, in the United States there was a law passed making female genital mutilation um, against the law, except in the cases of medical procedures, like when children like me are deemed too different to simply leave intact. I argue that it is time we also ban this medical act, which I have, and countless others have, experienced as a form of torture. We deserve to have the chance to experience life, love, and the pursuit of happiness with our original, beautiful bodies intact. Thank you very much.